All right, hello everyone. I'm Lindsay Brown with the Beyond Clean team. Dr. Larry Muscarella is the president of LFM Healthcare Solutions, LLC a company that focuses on improving the quality of healthcare and the safety of the public. Dr. Muscarella provides advice about the causes and prevention of healthcare associated infections, particularly those linked to contaminated reusable medical devices and equipment. This presentation will cover the new proposed classification scheme for disinfection and sterilization of flexible endoscopes by regulation and industry standard guidelines. Uh, I am honored to welcome Dr. Larry Muscarella. Good afternoon. Today's lecture is entitled, The Disinfection or Sterilization of Flexible Endoscopes, a newly proposed classification scheme. I thank you for your attendance today. Today's objectives are several, and they include summarizing some of the FDA's alerts discussing the risk of reprocessed flexible endoscopes infecting patients. We'll review some superbug cases that have been linked to flexible endoscopes, different types of flexible endoscopes. During this presentation, I've defined superbugs as CRE, or carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, and related multidrug-resistant organisms. Some of the other objectives of this lecture today are to list some risk factors for ineffective high-level disinfection. I'll provide some guidance for facilities thinking of switching from high-level disinfection to sterilization of flexible endoscopes. We'll discuss whether all flexible endoscopes pose the same risk of transmitting CRE and a related multidrug resistant organism. And I'll introduce a new three-tiered flexible endoscope classification scheme that I developed specifically to help hospitals considering moving from high-level disinfection of flexible endoscopes to sterilization. According to the CDC, more healthcare-associated infections have been linked to contaminated endoscopes, specifically flexible endoscopes, than to any other type of reusable device. And this is a very notable finding. Duodenoscopes and bronchoscopes, and for example, cystoscopes and gastroscopes, these are examples of flexible endoscopes, as you're likely aware. Flexible endoscopes pose a higher infection risk, primarily because of the following traits. Endoscopes are designed with heat-sensitive components, and therefore they cannot be sterilized using the gold standard, which is steam sterilization. They can be contaminated with high numbers of pathogens during use. They can feature complex surfaces onto which inaccessible biofilms may form during routine use, and these biofilms may be difficult to remove during cleaning, and therefore can pose an increased risk of infection. And flexible endoscopes being reusable may be reused several times a day on multiple patients. So if the instrument is contaminated and improperly cleaned, several inf patients throughout the day can become infected. And these are the reasons why flexible endoscopes are a concern. And as I said, according to the CDC, ha are more likely to uh, be contaminated and transmit infections than any other type of reusable device. About five years ago, the FDA reported for the first time that reprocessed duodenoscopes, that is those that had been cleaned and disinfected according to their instructions for use or IFUs, could transmit superbugs. You recall that duodenoscopes are used to perform a procedure called ERCP, which is an upper gastrointestinal endoscopic procedure that's used to treat disorders of the bile and the pancreatic ducts. For example, ERCP may be used to remove gallbladder stones. These type of devices are complex in design, and they feature a unique, novel mechanism called a forcep elevator mechanism. And this reportedly can hinder cleaning and remain contaminated despite brushing, therefore posing an increased risk 
of patient-to-patient -patient disease transmission. The FDA ominously advised in the same 2015 safety alert that meticulously cleaning the duodenoscope, while it should reduce the risk of it transmitting bacteria to be sure, it may not necessarily entirely eliminate this risk. And we know that when we reprocess a reusable device, the goal obviously is to prevent transmission of all types of organisms. That's the purpose of reprocessing. And the second comment that the FDA made that was notable about duodenoscopes and the safety alert was that infectious debris, which includes fluids, organic debris, other types of materials, that quote, these materials may remain on the duodenoscope after cleaning and disinfection. And again, when we reprocess an endoscope, we want it to be free of all infectious organisms. In this alert, the FDA highlighted a new concern, a type of watershed moment, if you will. And that concern was that duodenoscopes can transmit CRE and related MDROs, even when the manufacturer's reprocessing instructions are followed correctly by staff. Again, in the past, this was not the concern. Usually when an endoscope transmitted disease, it was an identified reprocessing lapse. What the FDA is pointing out now is that absent reprocessing lapses, a duodenoscope could still possibly transmit a superbug. Seven months later, the FDA issued another safety alert in which I notified the public that reprocessed bronchoscopes, similar to duodenoscopes, that they could remain persistently contaminated with bacteria, that cleaning and high-level disinfection may not always be sufficient. In particular, the FDA identified two specific risk factors. The first one is an obvious one, the failure to adhere to the manufacturer's reprocessing instructions would contribute to an infection risk, to be sure. And the second point is not as obvious, though, and warrants attention and discussion now, that the use of a damaged or poorly maintained or inadequately serviced or improperly repaired bronchoscope, that it too could remain persistently contaminated despite reprocessing and transmit infection. In this alert, the FDA noted that the infection risk associated with bronchoscopes is reported to be lower than that for duodenoscopes. And this is probably due in part due to the fact that duodenoscopes feature at their distal tip a somewhat unique forcep elevator mechanism that bronchoscopes do not feature. Bronchoscopes are much simpler in design than duodenoscopes, and this contributes to, likely to, the lower reported risk. Bronchoscopes are used to examine a patient's throat, larynx, trachea, and lower airways, as you're probably already aware. Now let's review a few superbug outbreaks that have been linked to duodenoscopes. In 2012, a sealed duodenoscope model, for the first time globally, that is overseas and in the US, was linked to a deadly superbug outbreak in Europe. The implicated duodenoscope model featured what we call a closed elevator wire channel. And this channel cannot be cleaned or disinfected because it's sealed. Indeed, it precludes reprocessing by design. In older models, however, the elevator cable channel is open and requires reprocessing, typically using a syringe to flush the channel with detergent, followed by a high-level disinfectant, followed by rinse water. Investigators reported that the design of this newer sealed duodenoscope model, while it was intended to simplify reprocessing, in fact, to eliminate the reprocessing of that channel, it ironically was hampering cleaning and disinfection, such that the duodenoscope's distal end could remain contaminated despite being reprocessed according to the manufacturer's IFUs. The researchers investigating this outbreak in the Netherlands further determined that a specific rubber O-ring that's intended to seal closed the duodenoscope's elevator wire channel, that it might become worn and torn and fail, facilitating the contamination of the duodenoscope, and once contaminated, transmitting superbugs from one patient to the next. 
This marked a watershed moment because previously virtually every infection linked to a contaminated GI endoscope had been attributed to an identifiable reprocessing lapse. For example, the disinfectant was used below its minimum effective concentration or the instrument's working channel was not properly cleaned using a brush where the instrument may have been stored wet in a poorly ventilated cabinet, allowing for bacteria to proliferate overnight and then infecting the patient the next day during the endoscopic procedure. This outbreak in the Netherlands ended when the medical facility removed this duodenoscope model from clinical use, replacing it with an older model with a elevator wire channel that was opened and could be reprocessed. The next year, in 2013, another manufacturer sealed duodenoscope model, this time not for in Europe, but for the first time in the U.S., was linked to an outbreak of CRE, actually in Illinois. The implicated duodenoscope's design, just as in the previous case in the Netherlands, was found to make cleaning difficult. As a result, the device's distal end may remain contaminated even after recommended reprocessing is performed. These are quotations published by the CDC, which investigated this outbreak in, the, in Illinois. Based on this case, U.S. health officials acknowledged, also for the first time, that reprocessed duodenoscopes with no identifiable breach could pose an infection risk and specifically transmit the deadly CRE, which some of you may be aware can be associated with the mortality rate of as high as 50, 50 percent. The mitigation for this outbreak was slightly different than the previous one. Specifically, the medical facility terminated this outbreak by replacing high-level disinfection of the duodenoscope with ethylene oxide gas sterilization. Over the last eight years, several other super bug outbreaks across the U.S. were similarly linked to wadenscopes, including at medical facilities in the following cities. Boston, Los Angeles, New York City are examples, among several other cities. Now let's discuss some expert assessments of the safety of current practices for reprocessing duodenoscopes and certain other types of medical devices. In the wake of these superbug outbreaks that we just discussed, the safety of current reprocessing practices for duodenoscopes has been questioned. For instance, some experts have concluded the following. Proper use of high-level disinfection alone may not eliminate multidrug-resistant organisms from duodenoscopes. Recommended reprocessing guidelines are not sufficient. The present reprocessing and process control procedures are not adequate and safe. These are each the quotes of experts, and there's a number following each of the quotes, and you may contact me separately to obtain the references, that is, who specifically made these quotes. Upon request, I will provide the references to this entire lecture. The following are additional quotes and opinions from experts in the field. The solution to this problem is to move to routine sterilization for duodenoscopes. Even flexible endoscopes less complex in design than duodenoscopes, such as, for example, bronchoscope, quote, may fail high-level disinfection and cause infections. Echoing the FDA's conclusions that we've discussed earlier, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that it appears that duodenoscopes, quote, have the potential to remain contaminated with pathogenic bacteria, which would include superbugs, even after recommended reprocessing is performed, unquote. And remember, this is a watershed moment because previously, virtually every case of disease transmission associated with flexible endoscope was due to a, an observed or identifiable reprocessing lapse or breach. Let's now discuss four supplemental measures that the FDA published in 2015 
to increase the safety of duodenoscopes. As noted earlier in 2015, the FDA published that duodenoscopes, due to their design, can hinder reprocessing, they can therefore remain contaminated, and therefore pose a risk of transmitting CRE and related superbugs, even when these devices are cleaned and high-level disinfected according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. In response, the FDA issued a notice six months later suggesting facilities adopt one or more of the following four specific quote-unquote supplemental measures to mitigate the risk of a duodenoscope transmitting CRE and related superbugs. These four FDA recommended supplemental measures are the following. Sterilization of the duodenoscope using a low temperature sterilization process, such as one that might use ethylene oxide gas, repeating high level disinfection of the duodenoscope, use of a liquid chemical sterilant processing system, and microbiologically culturing the reprocessed duodenoscope for superbugs prior to use. And in this fourth measure, the instrument would be cultured, it would be quarantined for approximately two days pending the results of the culturing, and if the instrument was determined to be bacteria free, then it would be reused. If it was not bacteria free, then it would be reprocessed again until the cultures were negative. Keep in mind that according to the FDA, each of these supplemental measures are to be performed after cleaning and high level disinfecting the duodenoscope in accordance with the manufacturer's labeling and instructions for use. I'd like to now make a brief comment about disposable instrumentation. On October 29th of last year, the FDA issued an important notice recommending that healthcare facilities and manufacturers transition to duodenoscopes with disposable components to simplify or eliminate reprocessing. And an example of such a component might be a disposable end cap at the distal end of the duodenoscope. In addition, manufacturers have recently developed entirely disposable endoscopes to mitigate the risk of duodenoscopes transmitting these superbugs. So now we have two types of designs as the marketplace is moving forward. Duodenoscopes that have disposable components, typically on their distal tip. This may or may not include a disposable forcep elevator mechanism. And then the rest of the instrument would be reprocessed per the manufacturer's IFUs. And the second design is an entirely disposable endoscope, specifically duodenoscope, to mitigate the risk of disease transmission during ERCP. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a bronchology organization recommended last March that disposable bronchoscopes be considered to perform bronchoscopy on a patient with suspected or confirmed infection. And this, of course, would be to reduce the risk of exposing healthcare staff to the disease when performing bronchoscopy. Let's now discuss factors that can adversely impact high-level disinfection and cause it to be ineffective. In general, high-level disinfection of a flexible endoscope or another semi-critical instrument prevents cross-infection. There are several factors, however, that we can't overlook that can have an adverse impact on the process, thereby increasing the risk of transmitting CRE or a related superbug during ERCP, for example, if the duodenoscope remains contaminated. These factors include, among others, the complex design of the instrument. If the instrument has surfaces or crevices that cannot be properly cleaned, then this can interfere with the effectiveness of high-level disinfection. Another factor would be improper manual cleaning of the endoscope. Of course, if you can't properly clean the instrument, then the risk of subsequent high-level disinfection, or sterilization for that matter, the risk of it failing increases. A third factor is damage to the instrument. If you take a borescope and sometimes look down the working channel of a damaged endoscope, you can see a buildup of materials. It can be infectious and uh, biofilms at times. And if these materials, these infectious debris, is not removed during cleaning as a result of damage to the instrument, maybe a tear in the working channel, uh, 
then that too can prevent high-level disinfection from being inf effective and thereby increasing the risk of disease transmission. And another factor is poor maintenance or servicing or repair of the endoscope using, for example, materials that might be uh, out of spec and not consistent with the original equipment manufacturer's uh, specifications. Depending on the circumstances and to overcome these factors, sterilization may be necessary. These factors are almost the Achilles heels of endoscopes. And in order to improve safety, sterilization at times may be necessary in lieu of high level disinfection. Let's review a superbug outbreak that was linked to a bronchoscope. Bronchoscopes are much simpler in design than duodenoscopes, as you know, but they too are not immune from superbug outbreaks. In 2014, patients exposed to a single bronchoscope were linked to infections in the state of Pennsylvania. Multidrug resistant bacteria were recovered from the bronchoscope and were found to be genetically related to the same bacteria that had infected the case patients. Investigators using a borescope examined the internal lumen of the bronchoscope and found that it had a defect. And as we talked previously uh, on the earlier slide, a defect can harbor infectious material and then pose an increased risk of patient-to-patient -patient disease transmission. The investigators of this outbreak in Pennsylvania concluded that the exposure of the patients to the bronchoscope was responsible for transmitting the bacteria, that the bronchoscope itself was the vector for transmission, and that reprocessing should include not just cleaning and disinfection, but one of the steps should be inspection of the bronchoscope's internal working channel using, for example, a borescope. Now let's review, similarly, a superbug outbreak linked to a gastroscope. So we've talked now about superbug outbreaks linked to duodenoscopes. We just talked about one to a bronchoscope. Let's talk about one uh, related to or describing an outbreak that was linked to a gastroscope, which is an instrument used to examine the upper GI tract. Four years ago, an outbreak in Pennsylvania was linked to patient exposure to the same gastroscope. The investigators observed staff cleaning and disinfection of the endoscopes, and they reported that they could not identify any lapse or any missteps in cleaning and disinfecting the endoscope. But when they observed the internal channel of the gastroscope using a boroscope, they were able to identify deep scratches in the lumen of the gastroscope, and in these deep scratches were materials that appeared to be potentially infectious debris. These investigators concluded that the gastroscope likely transmitted the CRE superbug to the patients. And more important, or as important, the investigators found that the endoscopes less complex than a duodenoscope may also fail high-level disinfection and cause infections. So previously, duodenoscopes were generally the ones that the press is focused on in terms of infecting patients with superbugs, including CRE. But what this report found is that instruments that do not ha have the elevator forcep mechanism, that they too can fail high-level disinfection and transmit diseases. So that a less complex device such as a bronchoscope also could infect patients with superbugs. The mitigation of this outbreak was the following. It ended when the hospital returned the implicated gastroscope to the manufacturer and had it repaired and the working channel were placed. This ended this superbug outbreak. Let's discuss briefly colonoscopes. Two years ago, I found a report that a manufacturer filed in the FDA's adverse event database stating that two patients had developed a CRE infection following colonoscopy. Now, I want to point out that Two patients demonstrating infection with CRE after colonoscopy does not mean that the colonoscope infected the patient. It simply means that there was an association between the procedure and infection, but we need to perform a more thorough investigation to find out the true cause of the infections. 
This report did not provide a lot of details, but it is the first case that I was, am aware of and that I was able to identify linking a colonoscope to possible CRE transmission. Again, we need more information before we can definitively say that the colonoscope was responsible. As we're aware, colonoscopy is a very popular procedure. More than 10 million of them are performed a year in the U.S. So the implications of this, particularly reg this particular regulatory report are potentially significant because if we were to learn that colonoscopes could indeed transmit CRE, then the inverse impact that this finding could have on public health and on patients being screened for cancer, the implications could be significant and might warrant additional measures, uh, enhanced reprocessing measures, for example, of colonoscopes. But right now, this is a report that identified, uh, so let's keep this in mind, but let's not draw any conclusions that indeed the colonoscope infected the patients with the CRE because we don't know that. Let's review now some of the mitigations that we've discussed that hospitals adopted in order to terminate a superbug outbreak that they identified. We've talked about uh, switching to sterilization, but hospitals that were high level disinfecting the endoscope switched to sterilization and that ended the outbreak. Some other measures include microbiologically culturing and quarantining the endoscope to ensure its safety, and if it remains contaminated, reprocessing it again until the cultures are negative for, the, for potentially infectious bacteria. Some hospitals um, might perform double high-level disinfection to reduce the risk of an endoscope, particularly duodenoscope, infecting patients. The FDA also, as one of their four supplemental measures, recommended use of a liquid chemical sterilant processing system. Of course, removing any implicated endoscope from clinical use is always a very effective mitigation for preventing additional infections. Servicing and repairing the endoscope uh, is an important mitigation that an improperly serviced endoscope or one that was, has not been maintained can retain debris and if returned to the manufacturer or another servicing company to be repaired, um, this is an effective mitigation. Using a borescope to inspect the endoscope for contamination and or for damage is another uh, very effective mitigation to reduce the risk of an endoscope transmitting a disease. Of course, retraining staff on the proper cleaning of the endoscope is an important mitigation. And one also that hospitals might consider is using a disposable endoscope to prevent patient-to-patient -patient disease transmission during an endoscopic procedure. Now let's discuss Spalding's device classification scheme. Many of you are probably already familiar with it, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's important to give some background information as this lecture will start to uh, focus on a newly proposed classification scheme that I developed for the reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. So in 1968, Earl Spaulding developed a strategy that we use today for determining whether a device can be sterilized or is required to be sterilized or whether disinfection of that reusable medical equipment might be sufficient. So his scheme classifies a medical device, which you're familiar with, into one of three categories based on their intended use, as specified in their labeling, and their documented risk or anticipated risk of infecting a patient with a pathogen. The first category are critical devices, which we're all familiar with. They contact sterile tissues or the vascular system. The second group are semi-critical devices, and they contact intact mucous membranes or non-intact skin. And the third category, the third group, are non-critical devices or environmental surfaces. And these contact only intact skin of the patient, or they do not directly contact the patient. Now, for each of these three categories, Spalding established whether sterilization or disinfection would be necessary to prevent a reusable device from transmitting disease. His first category is critical devices, and those pose a high risk of infection, and therefore, according to the scheme, they would require sterilization. Sterilization, you'll recall, destroys all types of microorganisms, 
that is high numbers of bacterial endospores, non-enveloped and enveloped viruses, vegetative bacteria, and the causative agent of tuberculosis as well. Examples of critical devices include intravenous catheters, orthopedic implants, and surgical instruments. Next, what was so ingenious about the Spalding st strategy is that it proposed not one but three levels of disinfection for devices and environmental surfaces that would not reasonably require sterilization. And these three levels of disinfection are low, intermediate, and high level. Now the second category, the first being critical, the second is semi-critical devices. And they pose a lower but still a moderate or significant potential infection risk. And they would require, according to Spalding's scheme, at least high level disinfection. This process is similar but distinctly different from sterilization. It too inactivates vegetative bacteria, mycobacteria, viruses and fungi, but only some bacterial spores does it eradicate, and typically in low numbers, where sterilization, by definition, destroys all types of bacterial spores, in, including those in high numbers. Examples we discussed, uh, duodenoscopes, bronchoscopes, gastroscopes, rigid laryngoscopes, and respiratory therapy equipment. Now, I'd like to provide a brief note about sterilization. In March of 2015, the FDA published a guidance document in which it recommended that semi-critical devices, which would include duodenoscopes, for example, quote unquote, should be sterilized. Advising further that high level disinfection be used, quote, if the device design does not permit sterilization, unquote. For example, if the device might be damaged by sterilization. So here the FDA is indicating that while high-level disinfection at a minimum should be performed for semi-critical devices, it's clearly establishing, even five years ago, that it favors the sterilization of these devices when feasible and when permissible, such that the process would not damage the instrument. Similarly, the FDA advised later that same year in 2015 that when feasible, quote, duodenoscopes should be sterilized due to the greater margin of safety that sterilization provides. Now let's discuss Spalding's third category of medical devices, specifically those for non-critical devices, which he placed in this third category because they pose a low infection risk. And for the instruments in this category, he recommended intermediate or low level disinfection to prevent disease transmission. Intermediate level disinfection is virucidal and tuberculocidal, but it is not sporicidal. And this is a distinguishing factor of intermediate level disinfection from both high level disinfection and sterilization, which are both sporicidal. An example of an intermediate level disinfectant would be an EPA registered hospital disinfectant labeled with a tuberculocidal claim. In contrast, low-level disinfection destroys vegetative bacteria and some viruses, but it is neither tuberculocidal nor sporicidal. An example would be an EPA-registered hospital disinfectant with a claim to destroy the hepatitis P virus, excuse me, the hepatitis B virus, or HIV. By the way, low-level disinfection would be expected to destroy the virus responsible for the COVID-19 disease. That virus is an enveloped virus. Examples of non-critical devices include blood pressure cuffs, bedpans, and for example, stethoscopes. Now we'll discuss my newly proposed three-tiered classification scheme for flexible endoscopes, which are semi-critical devices. Whereas the Spalding scheme classifies all types of devices, critical, semi-critical, non-critical into one of these three categories. My proposed classification scheme categorizes flexible endoscopes themselves into one of three categories based on the risk of infection, understanding that 
not every type of flexible endoscope has been reported to pose the same risk of transmitting CRE or a related multi-drug resistant organism. The superbug outbreaks that we've discussed today, along with the FDA notices and the conclusions of a number, uh, a number of experts talking about the effectiveness of high-level disinfection, these raise questions about the safety of today's reprocessing practices, specifically the cleaning and disinfecting of flexible endoscopes. In response, I developed an evidence-based paradigm or scheme to help guide medical facilities who are thinking about switching to sterilization of flexible endoscopes. They're currently high-level disinfecting them, but they're thinking of switching to sterilization because of, for example, maybe they encountered an outbreak that was linked to improper repair of the endoscope or damage to the endoscope or inadequate cleaning of a complex surface within that instrument. So my scheme places flexible endoscopes into one of three categories based on their documented risk for transmitting a superbug. So this is not based just on the theory. This is based on when I reviewed the literature for different types of flex flexible endoscopes, was I able to identify some trends and determine that one type of endoscope might be associated with a higher risk of CRE than another. And indeed, I did find that. So similar to the Spalding classification scheme, I developed three groups, high risk flexible endoscopes, moderate risk flexible endoscopes, and low or negligible risk flexible endoscopes. Those are three groups into which we will now discuss how to categorize flexible endoscopes and identify which of those three groups we might place those endoscopes in, and then how we might process those three different types of endoscopes. The first of my three groups features high-risk flexible endoscopes, for which the literature suggests sterilization is now recommended, if not necessary, to prevent disease transmission and ensure safety. And there are specific traits unique to the flexible endoscopes that I would categorize into this first group. Specifically, these endoscopes have been reported to be associated with outbreaks of CRE or related superbug. They're physically complex in design and difficult to clean. For example, they may feature a forcep elevator mechanism. And they remain, may remain contaminated with superbugs, even when cleaned and high-level disinfected in accordance with their manufacturer's instructions. This group would include, we could probably all agree, duodenoscopes. And they also include possibly other types of endoscopes, such as a linear echo endoscope, which also features a forcep elevator mechanism. And although linear echo endoscopes are not reported to pose the same risk of infection as duodenoscopes, they do have this unique design feature that would cause them to be on our radar screens and to keep an eye on as being potential vectors for transmission of CRE and related superbugs, even when cleaned and disinfected according to manufacturer's instructions. The second group that I developed features moderate risk flexible endoscopes. Uh, and sterilization of the endoscopes in this group, while ideal, currently may not be practical or feasible for some facilities. So we're discussing now a phase-in category where sterilization may not be available or possible at this time, but on our radar is that these endoscopes in this category might too remain contaminated after reprocessing and therefore could pose a risk of infection. But right now, maybe the facility doesn't have a low temperature sterilization technology and we can't stop the procedures. So the instruments in this category would pose less of a risk than the previous category but ones that are, uh, are on our radar and something that we want to be, um, we want to focus on and keep an eye on and realize that these instruments too can transmit diseases even if clean and high level disinfected. The flexible endoscopes in this group, and this group would be the largest of the three, that is more endoscopes would be in this group than any of the other two groups. They're simpler in physical design and easier to clean than duodenoscopes, and they pose a lower risk of transmitting superbugs, um, specifically a lower risk of transmitting a superbug than a duodenoscope. The endoscopes in this group might be bronchoscopes, cystoscopes, gastroscopes, and colonoscopes. I'll point out that 
each facility would perform a risk assessment and determine which endoscopes would go into each of these three groups. So this is not per se a fixed scheme where I am identifying specifically which endoscopes a hospital would put into this group. I'm providing assistance and kind of direction to help you determine in a risk assessment which endoscopes the facility are using, which might they put into group one. They may decide that all the flexible endoscopes go into group one. I'm giving you a flexible phase-in kind of categorization scheme uh, that helps you um, identify particular risks, and then as time goes on, you phase in and may shift to entirely to sterilization, but at this time, sterilization may not be entirely feasible, so I'm giving you a framework into which the risk assessment performed by the stakeholders would determine which endoscopes go into which groups. For example, one hospital might determine that bronchoscopes would go into the first group, not into the second group. Until the facility then can phase in sterilization, it may consider implementing one of the FDA's other three supplemental measures. We discussed four. One was sterilization, and there were three others, for example, performing high-level disinfection twice. And for the instruments in this particular group, the hospital's risk assessment may conclude that performing one of these other enhanced measures is important to reduce the risk of disease transmission, specifically of multidrug-resistant bacteria. The caveat that I add here is that the infection risk associated with this group's endoscopes could increase significantly if the endoscopes are not correctly cleaned, they're not stored properly, they're not maintained according to manufacturer's instructions, or uh, there's a damage to the endoscope, something that is of concern. While the instruments in this group, sterilization would not be mandated, we still want to be concerned that there's circumstances in which, for example, an outbreak occurs, uh, then we may want to move to sterilization to terminate that outbreak. So sterilization could become necessary if any of the group's endoscopes are linked to a superbug outbreak or if they remain persistently contaminated. So a bronchoscope, for example, that a risk assessment a hospital performs might put into group two and therefore continue performing high-level disinfection, maybe with a supplemental measure, which is what I recommend, that would be fine if the infection rate is nominal, but if we identify that that instrument is persistently contaminated, then high-level disinfection would not be something we would continue to perform. In this case, sterilization would likely become necessary. Now let's talk about the third group. This features endoscopes that pose a low risk of transmitting a multidrug-resistant bacteria, specifically CRE or a related superbug. And while sterilization is preferred for all types of flexible endoscopes, per the FDA's guidance we discussed earlier, it may not be necessary to improve safety for the endoscopes that the hospital's risk assessment places into this specific third group. Flexible endoscopes in this group might include uh, a channelless probe, for example. These are instruments that are simple in physical design, and they pose a lower negligible risk of transmitting superbugs provided the endoscope is properly cleaned, it's high-level disinfected using a disinfectant above its minimum effective concentration at the right time, at the right temperature, that the endoscope is rinsed with bacteria-free water, that the instrument is dried and then stored and maintained according to the manufacturer's IFUs, as well as repaired uh, when necessary and when damage is identified. The endoscopes that a facility might reasonably place into this group per their risk assess assessment would include, for example, or might include hysteroscopes, ultrasound probes, TEE probes. Again, channels instruments that are not complex in design and into which, unless there's unidentified damage, typically these instruments would not pose a risk of transmitting CRE, provided, again, that they're properly reprocessed, stored, and maintained according to manufacturer's instructions. If circumstances warrant, the facility may consider implementing at least one of the FDA's supplemental measures that we discussed, uh, again, such as double high-level disinfection, to improve the safety of this group's endoscopes. While I recommend this, and certainly do for the instruments in the second group, uh, 
uh, the endoscopes in this third group, these supplemental measures, while I would still recommend them, the emphasis I place on them would be less than in the second group. Caveat again is that sterilization of instruments, even in this third low risk group, might still become necessary if these endoscopes are linked to a superbug outbreak or they found, they're found to be persistently contaminated. So if we have an outbreak linked to any of these, uh, one of the mitigations to prevent additional infections uh, might be to implement sterilization. And in fact, sterilization may be necessary, particularly if there's a tear on the instrument, for example, and it's remaining persistently contaminated. Remember, I developed this practical phase in scheme because not every flexible endoscope poses the same risk of transmitting CRE or a related superbug. Therefore, sterilization per the hospital's risk assessment Sterilization may not be required of all flexible endoscopes in inventory, only certain ones that pose a particular risk. Once the medical facility has then classified its endoscopes in inventory into one of these three groups, per the conclusions of its risk assessment activities, I recommend it perform the following three steps. First, I recommend identifying several low temperature sterilization technologies that are available in the US and they're labeled for specifically processing flexible endoscopes. This is an important first step in selecting an appropriate technology. The second step, I recommend reviewing the labeling of these technologies and devices and then determine from the labeling which is appropriate for processing the types of endoscopes the facility has in its inventory and is placed into group one and also possibly into group two. Ideally, you wanna purchase a technology that can be used on the majority of your endoscopes. So you may wanna plan ahead and then select a device that you think will be most appropriate, not just for one type of your endoscope, but if you were to decide to move to sterilization for other types of endoscopes and in inventory, you wanna see if you can uh, purchase a product that would be suitable for use in, in as many of the endoscopes in inventory as possible. An important point is to confirm that the technology that you decide to purchase is compatible with the endoscope and its materials. You don't want to purchase a low temperature sterilizing agent or sterilization technology that then would be incompatible with the majority of your endoscopes. So there will be some give and take here. We try to match up as best as you can the labeling of the low temperature sterilization technology that you're thinking of purchasing. Make sure that it's as compatible as possible from a material standpoint and from an effectiveness standpoint with the endoscopes and inventory that you have determined you, you would want to move to sterilization. And then as a third step, purchase the appropriate sterilization technology, read its labeling, get thoroughly trained on it, and then use it safely. That completes the formal presentation of my lecture. And I thank you for your time and attendance today. But before ending, I'd like to summarize some of this lecture's conclusions. To summarize, more healthcare associated infections have been linked to contaminated flexible endoscopes than to any other type of reusable device. And this is a very notable finding. The types of infections we talked about today focused on superbug infections, namely those caused by carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae and related multi-drug resistant organisms. We talked about how superbug infections have been linked not only to duodenoscopes, but also to other types of flexible endoscopes, including bronchoscopes and gastroscopes. We talked about how superbugs may be transmitted by a flexible endoscope despite cleaning and disinfecting the device according to the manufacturer's labeling and IFUs. One reason for this could be that the instrument is damaged and a biofilm may have formed in an inaccessible surface and therefore reprocessing the endoscope correctly may still result in the device harboring debris and exposing patients to an infectious organism. So therefore, improper maintenance, faulty servicing, and or incomplete repairing of a flexible endoscope are important risk factors among others 
for superbug infections and transmissions. We talked about how due to several factors, including improper maintenance, high level disinfection, particularly of duodenoscopes, may not always be sufficient to prevent superbug transmissions. We also talked about how complex designs can hinder cleaning and therefore pose an increased risk of infection. We talked about an FDA guidance document in 2015 that advocated sterilization of semi-critical devices when feasible, that is when the sterilization process would not damage the instrument. Otherwise, the FDA recommends high-level disinfection of semi-critical devices. In addition, the FDA recommends that facilities consider adopting one or more supplemental measures to improve the safety of duodenoscope reprocessing. We talked about how not every flexible endoscope poses the same risk of transmitting CRE or a related superbug. In response, I developed a three-tiered paradigm for classifying flexible endoscopes based on their risk as documented in the literature of transmitting a superbug, such as CRE. This paradigm adopts an evidence-based cost-effective approach to help guide medical facilities that are thinking about switching from high-level disinfection to sterilization for one or more type of its flexible endoscopes in inventory. That completes my lecture today. I again thank you for your participation and your interest in this topic. As I said earlier in the lecture, references are available upon request. Just contact me. I thank you again, and now I will take some questions. All right, Dr. Muscarella, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, as is expected, we've had some great questions come through. Uh, so if you'd like to join me on webcam, uh, we can get started on those. All right, and we'll get connected in just a second here. <clears throat> Dr. Muscarella, let me know when you can hear me. All right, testing one, two. <clears throat> you may have to refresh your screen. If we can get you connected, we certainly will. Otherwise, we're happy to, um, to send questions via email as well. So we'll just give it a couple seconds here and see if we can't get connected. All right. I think. Uh, Dr. Muscarella, do you want to just refresh your screen really quick and we'll see if that will solve the problem. Just reconnect to webcam and we'll get going. Oh, I hear something. <laughs> yep. I refreshed and that seemed, there we to, go. Have, yeah, that seemed to solve the problem. Thank you for that Wonderful. suggestion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you could make it work. Um, I don't see you on webcam yet, but at least the audio is working, and that's the main thing for question and answer. If anyone has questions from the audience that you'd like to submit for Dr. Muscarella on this topic or anything related, uh, feel free to enter those into the lower left-hand corner in the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, Dr. Muscarella, the first question um, that came through is, if the IFU do not prescribe sterilization. Would you suggest double processing of the scope, including cleaning? So thank you for the question. And uh, I'm assuming you can hear me, Lindsay. Uh, oh, I can hear you and see you now. That's great. Yeah, great. So the if the labeling does contraindicate sterilization or one type of a sterilization, you might consider uh, if there was an alternative type of sterilization, you might consider double hive level disinfection. You might also consider the culturing um, and quarantining method uh, in order to mitigate the risk of infection. So sterilization, as we talked about, is ideal. Uh, 
But there are other measures that can uh, improve the safety of high-level disinfection, such as proper maintenance, proper repair, um, and servicing of the device. So uh, of the supplemental measures, sterilization would be the ideal one, but there are three other ones. You can look on the FDA's website, and um, high-level disinfection is one of those four. There's some data that suggests that maybe high-level disinfection performed twice uh, is not as uh, effective as you might uh, want it to be, uh, but that is certainly uh, an option is performing high-level disinfection twice and, as I said, uh, culturing and quarantine the device until it's demonstrated to be safe. Any other good questions? Okay, yes, a couple other questions came through. After the high-level disinfection of semi-critical devices, how can we ensure that the device is transported aseptically? Uh, another good question. First and foremost, after high-level disinfection, you want to make sure that the instrument is dry. If it is being transported uh, wet and in an open container, this would increase the risk of uh, recontamination of the endoscope. You might put the endoscope into a tub or a container that has been at least high-level disinfected, if not sterilized, and then cover that container so that the um, process would be one such that it would prevent recontamination of your effectively high-level disinfected endoscope. That would depend on your resources. It would depend kind of on your uh, dirty, clean flow. Uh, but a dry, high-level disinfected endoscope that is handled aseptically, if you will, and stored in a well-ventilated, clean environment uh, should be safe for reuse after some number of days. There's some controversy about and, and a lack of data about how many days different types of endoscopes can be stored safely before being reused without having to require reprocessing before reuse. But generally, you would apply some operating room techniques about how to handle a device without recontaminating it, how to handle it aseptically. You could apply those same models and paradigms to the transfer of the semi-critical flexible endoscope. Okay. This next question says, wouldn't a scope that would be used, that would use a biopsy forcep to take a sample of tissue be considered a higher risk scope? Uh, good question. If the instrument is maintained properly, serviced properly, cleaned according to manufacturer's instructions, disinfected, assuring that the concentration is adequate, the exposure is proper, um, then the high-level disinfection would be safe, and using the biopsy forcep would not, the data suggest, increase the risk of this device becoming more of a risky or a less safe device. So I guess what the question might be is toward the fact that the biopsy forceps are sterile, and so if we're putting sterile biopsy forceps down a high-level disinfected scope, don't we create some problems? For consistency, you might say for the uh, sterile biopsy forceps, yes, let's categorize all our flex endoscopes and inventory into that category one. But the data suggests that is not necessary, that if the instrument is adequately cleaned, properly dried, rinsed with bacteria-free water, that if a truly high-level disinfected scope is used, that placing a sterile biopsy forcep down that channel would not increase any risks for the patient. And I'm specifically talking about there the devices in the class two or class three categories that I developed. But you are, uh, you can in your risk assessment based on that question, categorize and put all of your flexible endoscopes, albeit semi-critical devices, into class one such that they would all be sterile and therefore any sterile biopsy forcep that was passed down their working channel would be consistent from a decontamination standpoint with the reprocessing of the endoscope. But this will go to a risk assessment uh, in terms of how well the instrument is being ma maintained, no damage, it's being repaired and serviced properly, then your risk of a sterile forcep down a disinfected endoscope would be negligible, if not, uh, would be low, if not negligible. Okay. Do you recommend sending endoscopes to the manufacturer on a routine basis for examination beyond the manufacturer's recommendation? So, really good question. The labeling of some of the devices, particularly the duodenoscopes, for example, I think part of their 510K clearance requires that the hospital send 
the duodenoscope back to the manufacturer for inspection, particularly of the distal tip, to ensure that there are no irregularities that could pose an increased risk of infection. I would write the policies and procedures such that one of the steps of endoscope reprocessing that can be often overlooked after cleaning is inspection of the device. So we will inspect the device not just for the presence of soil that might warrant us to re-clean the device before disinfection. Those irregularities might also tell us that there is damage. So it's one of those things, for example, that when our automobiles say, take your car in for service every year, if the red light on the dashboard comes on before a year, you would take it more frequently than that year. So the, the year is the maximum number. In general, that is where most will fall, that to have the manufacturer inspect per the IFUs, which specifically for duodenoscope says that. I'm not sure it says it for all the other endoscopes. Maybe it should, but I don't know that it says it. So that that would be a general guide and absolutely sending it to the manufacturer more frequently um, could be judicious but then we start getting into some cost issues. I mean, you don't want to send it back to the manufacturer once every month if we don't have a problem. So let's inspect it. Let's keep an eye on it. At the worst case, let's send it back once every year. But if there's an alarm, if there's some data that suggests there's persistent contamination of the endoscope because we're noticing an increase in the number of infections um, or clusters of cases, then absolutely we would send it back to the manufacturer. Or at the very least, we would call the manufacturer, explain the specific clinical circumstances and the culturing results that you're getting, and see what the manufacturer then says. But yes, sending it back more often to the manufacturer may be necessary, but in general, once a year should be sufficient. Okay, thank you so much. That is all the time that we have. Thank you, Dr. Muscarella, for delivering such an enlightening discussion on the future of flexible endoscope reprocessing. If you have any questions we weren't able to get to, I will certainly get those over to Dr. Muscarella so that he can email you directly. Uh, as a reminder, there will be a 15-minute break before the next session. We're so glad you're here, and we look forward to having you back in the final session of the RESIST conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Muscarella, and for My everyone... Pleasure. In. For everyone tuning in, we'll see you in the next session. Take care. Bye.